Achilles, Agamemnon, Menelaus, Odysseus, Ajax, Nestor. These are the names of just some of the many heroes whose tales are told in Homer's great epic, The Iliad, one of the Western world's most famous works of literature. Consisting of well over 15,000 verses that are divided up into 24 chapters or books, the Iliad raises profound questions about morality, fate, honor, virtue, and the human condition. The Iliad is focused on the Trojan War, which was a legendary armed conflict between the Greeks and the Trojans, whose city, Troy, was along the northwestern coast of Asia Minor. Despite being steeped in Greek mythology, and with the gods constantly intervening to manipulate events on the battlefield in favor of their chosen side over the other, most scholars today believe that the Trojan War was likely based on an actual historical conflict. The exact date of the composition of the Iliad remains a subject of scholarly debate. While attributed to Homer, who's traditionally thought to have lived during the late 8th or 7th century BC, many experts on the subject believe that the Iliad itself was composed well before that, and passed down orally over several generations before finally being written down. Homer's descriptions of the weapons, armor, and other material culture, not to mention the political structure of the Greek coalition against the Trojans, are relatively consistent with archaeological findings dating to the Late Bronze Age. While several Bronze Age cultures existed in Greece, the one that seems to align closest to the world of the Iliad belongs to what we today call Mycenaean civilization. The term Mycenaean is a modern convention and named after the Bronze Age site of Mycenae, which was the most prominent and powerful kingdom in Greece at the time. In the Iliad, Mycenae's king, Agamemnon, is the leader of the coalition against the Trojans. Before we proceed any further, I just want to quickly mention the basic chronology that's used by archaeologists to categorize and date the phases of the Bronze Age on mainland Greece. Based primarily on the sequence of pottery styles found in archaeological excavations, the Helladic chronology is divided into three major periods. The Early Helladic, from 3200 to 2000 BC, the Middle Helladic, from 2000 to 1550 BC, and the Late Helladic from 1550 to 1050 BC. Each of these periods is further divided into several phases and subphases. While I'll do my best to give you approximate dates as much as possible so that you won't necessarily have to remember each period, I just want you to be aware of this relative chronology because any book I've ever read or museum that I've visited dedicated to Mycenaean civilization, or simply the Bronze Age in Greece, references it. Let's continue. The stories from the Iliad and Odyssey have fascinated mankind for millennia. But by late antiquity, most people considered such epics to have been little more than collections of myths and legends. Enter Heinrich Schliemann, an extremely wealthy businessman turned archaeologist. To say that he's controversial is an understatement, especially when it comes to his hasty and often destructive methods of excavation. He was also not the best at documenting his findings. Some have accused him of even planting several of the artifacts that he claims to have discovered in the ground himself. That said, we have to give credit where it's due. It's Schliemann's obsession with the Iliad and the world of Homer that led him in the late 19th century to spend a considerable amount of his time and fortune searching for the fabled city of Troy. With advice and help from English archaeologist Frank Calvert, he arrived at the site of Hisarlik on the coast of the Aegean in what's today northwestern Turkey. Calvert believed that Hisarlik was the site of ancient Troy, and eventually convinced Schliemann of this. Today, most archaeologists also seem to agree with him. Because Schliemann financed the excavation of the site, he, and not Calvert, gets most of the recognition for Troy's discovery. 
Over the years, the excavations led by Schliemann and archaeologists such as Christos Tasuntas, Alan Wace, Carl Bledgen, Lord William Taylor, George Milonis, and others at sites such as Mycenae, Tyrans, and Pylos have helped to lay down the foundation for our modern study of Mycenaean civilization. Getting a feel for Greece's geography can help us in understanding its history. It's a country that is crisscrossed by mountains and rough, rocky hills, which naturally divide up the land into many smaller physical units. The sea creates further divisions. Cutting through the central and southern portions of the mainland are the Gulf of Patras and the Gulf of Corinth, which almost physically separates the Peloponnese from the rest of the European continent. These lands are further penetrated by several other gulfs, including the Saronic, Argolic, Laconian, and Messenian gulfs. The sea also physically separates many of the inhabitable islands of the Aegean from the mainland as well. At first glance, it may seem impossible for a great civilization to develop in an area of the world with such challenging geography that not only made agriculture difficult, but also created sizable physical barriers that often isolated settled communities from each other. The good thing, though, is that many of these mountains gave way to fertile valleys with broad plains where crops could grow, and wherever such conditions existed, small farming villages would spring up. The land became even more manageable around 3000 BC with agricultural innovations such as the plow, which allowed farmers to cultivate even rockier land. Settlements also formed along the Gulf Coast, especially where there were bays suitable for harboring small ships that could trade with nearby communities along the shores of the Peloponnese, Attica, and the islands of the Aegean. It's in such areas that around the mid-17th century BC, several Mycenaean states and kingdoms were born. While today we know a great deal about who the Mycenaeans were and how they lived, the archaeological record currently provides little information as to where they may have come from. The many samples of their later written language, which today is known as Linear B, has been largely deciphered, and it's evident from this that they spoke in Indo-European language, specifically an early form of Greek. Based on this and other evidence, it was initially believed that the ancestors of the Mycenaeans were all groups of pastoralists who had migrated onto the Greek mainland from some area north of the Black Sea, most likely what's today the country of Ukraine. Whether this migration occurred all at once or gradually over the centuries is a matter of debate. In 2017, a DNA analysis was done on the remains of 19 ancient individuals, including Minoans from Crete, Mycenaeans from mainland Greece, and a few people from southwestern Anatolia. The study concluded that both the Mycenaean and Minoan samples shared at least three quarters of their ancestry with the first Neolithic farmers of western Anatolia and the Aegean. Most of the rest of their DNA matched with ancient populations from the Caucasus and Iran. However, the Mycenaean remains differed from the Minoans in that they also had ancestry that tied them to hunter-gatherers of Eastern Europe and Siberia. While a study on the remains of just 19 individuals is far from conclusive, it does open up the possibility that the Mycenaeans shared more in common with the indigenous Neolithic peoples of Greece than had originally been thought. Most scholars of Helletic studies agree that by around 1750 BC, the people that we today identify as the Mycenaeans had spread throughout central and southern Greece. Around this time, there was also a change in the distribution of settlements throughout the Greek peninsula. During the early phases of the Bronze Age, that is, around 3000 BC, before the Mycenaeans appeared in the archaeological record, settlements were widely spread throughout the land. However, 
a few centuries later, during the Middle Bronze Age, roughly between 2000 to 1550 BC, much of the population seems to have moved to new settlements that were clustered together around a focal point. Many of these sites would later on become the great Mycenaean citadels and palatial complexes that we're familiar with today. The exact reasons for this phenomenon are still unclear, but it indicates that economic, social, religious, and especially political activities were becoming more centralized. It may have also been for protection. In the dangerous world of the Bronze Age, there was greater safety in numbers. In 1876, the team led by Heinrich Schliemann discovered a tremendous cache of items made of gold and other precious metals and stones at a burial site within the citadel of Mycenae that they called Grave Circle A. The incredible objects uncovered from the graves included fine jewelry, gold diadems, intricately decorated swords, daggers, seals, rythons, and most famous of all, gold leaf death masks. One of these popularly became known as the now famous Mask of Agamemnon, though there's nothing indicating that such an object belonged to Agamemnon, nor is it from the 13th century BC when he would have lived. That is, also assuming, of course, that he was indeed a historical king of Mycenae. Archaeologists and art historians have dated the objects discovered in Grave Circle A to the 1500s BC. Archaeologists also discovered another, older burial site outside of the walls of Mycenae's Acropolis that they labeled Grave Circle B. Most scholars believe that the remarkable finds uncovered at both grave circles could not have been made by local artisans and metalsmiths. And to this day, no one has determined for sure where the gold used to create them came from. The region of Argolis, where Mycenae, Tiryns, and other important Bronze Age sites are located, is devoid of natural deposits of the precious yellow metal. Theories on the origin of these objects abound. Some have made the case that because Minoan craftsmen and smiths already had the skills to create such objects out of metal, stone, and ivory, that the items found within the two grave circles must have been manufactured abroad. Others believe that they may have been crafted by artisans living at some of the Minoan outposts on the Greek mainland. This makes sense because many of the motifs found on these objects are similar to those indigenous to northern and central Greece, and it's possible that Minoan artisans could have modified their products to better fit the tastes of their customers. It could also be the case that Mycenaean artisans were trained by Minoans to create such dazzling objects. Between the years 1900 to 1911, Archaeologist Arthur Evans and his team discovered thousands of clay tablets with a strange, unknown script at the Minoan palatial site of Canossus on Crete. Calling them Minoan hieroglyphics, it was eventually apparent that though related and with many similar, if not identical, signs, there were actually two different scripts amongst the tablets. One, which ended up being an earlier Minoan script, was called Linear A. As for the second script, it was dubbed Linear B, and had been appearing at several sites, not just on Crete, but also on the Greek mainland. In 1939, the largest cache of Linear B tablets was uncovered at Pylos. They, and other tablets like them, remained undeciphered until 1952, when philologist Michael Ventris determined that they were a syllabic, pictographic script and a very early form of Greek. Authorities on the two scripts are convinced that Linear B developed from the older Minoan script but was modified to accommodate the peculiarities of the Mycenaean Greek language. Like cuneiform that was invented in ancient Mesopotamia, the Linear B signs were incised on a soft, wet clay surface using a pointed stylus. When the clay dried, it hardened to form a tablet with the script engraved upon it. 
Unfortunately, the Linear B tablets discovered at various Mycenaean sites are not very descriptive. Most seem to contain administrative records with lists of commodities and finished goods distributed to various people or places, although a few do deal with troop deployments and religious matters. However, there are no lofty proclamations of great kings, excerpts from popular literature, diplomatic correspondence, treaties, or a corpus of lengthy religious texts similar to those found in the ancient languages of Mesopotamia and Egypt from around the same time period. An example of a typical Linear B text from a tablet discovered at Pylos goes as follows. A pair of tripods of Cretan workmanship. Tripod on one foot with one handle tripod. Tripod of Cretan workmanship burnt off at the legs. Jar of larger size, four-handled jar. A pair of jars of larger size, three-handled. Jar of smaller size, four-handled. The Linear B tablets discovered at sites throughout the Mycenaean world date to between 1400 to 1200 BC, with the overwhelming majority confined to the last few decades of that range, so we're really only getting a snapshot of what Mycenaean society at the major centers was like just before their imminent collapse. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Let's go back in time a few centuries. By 1500 BC, most of the larger clusters of settlements in central and southern Greece not only grew in size, but many of the hills they rested upon became increasingly fortified with stone walls and citadels, especially in the eastern Peloponnese and Viotia. Though we don't have any documented history of any particular wars or the results of specific battles, scholars believe that due to the increase in population in and around the early Mycenaean citadels, most armed conflicts, when they occurred, were over land and scarce resources. As mentioned earlier, arable land for growing crops was relatively scarce in Greece, and so keeping what you already had and obtaining more of it was a necessity. Conflicts must have also ensued over the lucrative trade routes that brought valuable metals such as copper, tin, gold, and silver into the Mycenaean world. At the top of the early Mycenaean social hierarchy was the local ruler, or Wanax. He was the one who held the ultimate political authority over his people, though some believe he may have also had a religious role. How one initially became the local Wanax isn't certain, but it's possible that he was chosen by a council of his peers because he was the best hunter or warrior. However, by the 16th century BC, the position had likely become a hereditary one like that of a king. From this point onward, I'll be using the terms Wanex and King interchangeably. Beneath the Wanex was the Lawagetas, who served as his second in command, or deputy. Archaeologists have uncovered numerous high status burials replete with fine daggers, swords, knives, boar's tusk helmets, bronze suits of armor, and obsidian points. Often along with such weapons were pottery and jars that once contained olive oil and wine. Even the graves of lesser status individuals contained such items, though of poorer quality and without much decoration. For ultra-high status individuals, such as the Wanex, a new type of burial structure, the Tholos, popularly known as the Beehive Tomb, became more common. Most Tholoi, which is the plural of Tholos, were built out of large stone blocks and assembled in a circular, beehive shape by placing each successive layer on stone over the previous one, but then tapering the diameter of the room or ceiling the higher one got. Such structures were usually built within the side of a hill or separately and then covered with earth. Many Thaloi had a wide entryway known as a dromos that led up to its entrance. For their occupant, or soon-to-be occupant, a tholos was the ultimate status symbol. The largest and most famous tholos is the so-called Treasury of Atreus, 
sometimes also called the Tomb of Agamemnon, at Mycenae and dates to around 1250 BC. Along with the body of the deceased, the typical tholos contained weapons and luxury items such as jewelry, objects made of gold, and beautifully decorated pottery that was usually imported. The ruins of the earliest known Mycenaean palace to have been excavated are at the site of Menelaon, just a few miles south of the city of Sparta. Though not the best preserved building from the Mycenaean era, archaeologists have been able to determine that the palace once had living quarters at its center with flanking corridors and secondary rooms, presumably for storage and craft production. The palace at Menelaon dates to around 1450 to 1400 BC. But just a few centuries later, the newer and much larger palaces at Tiryns, Mycenae, Thebes, Pylos, and Medea would outdo it. While the great Minoan palaces on Crete may have served as an inspiration, the Mycenaean palaces on the mainland had their own distinctive style of architecture. When it comes to the Minoan structures, the word palace is a bit of a misnomer, because most scholars believe that these massive buildings weren't royal residences at all, but instead political and economic administrative centers that monitored, stored, and redistributed agricultural output, important commodities, domesticated animals, raw materials, and finished goods such as pottery, wine, and olive oil. There's also plenty of evidence indicating that these large buildings were used for religious purposes as well. However, since palace has become the most widely used term to describe them, we'll stick with it here. Not every Minoan palace was exactly alike, but at the center of most of them was a large, rectangular courtyard that was surrounded by various buildings used as workshops and storage facilities. The main Minoan palace centers were Knossos, Phaistos, Malia, and Zakros, of which Knossos was the largest and today is still the best preserved. The major Mycenaean citadels and palaces also served their communities as administrative and redistribution centers, but unlike those on Crete, they were nearly all heavily fortified, the exception being Pylos, which doesn't seem to have had a massive fortification wall. Due to the sheer, gargantuan size of many of the stones used in their construction, the defensive walls at sites such as Mycenae and Tiryns are referred to as Cyclopean walls, because the ancient Greeks who came after the Mycenaeans believed that the strong, one-eyed giants known as the Cyclopses had built them. Also, unlike in Minoan society, the ruler, in this case Thoanix, lived with his family inside the Mycenaean palatial complexes. While the most powerful and well-known Mycenaean states were in the Peloponnese, there were several other major centers of Mycenaean activity north of the Isthmus of Corinth. Perhaps the greatest Mycenaean site of the north is Orchomenos in Viotia. Here, frescoes depicting warriors, chariots, and boar hunting were unearthed along with a large tholos which archaeologists called the Tomb or Treasury of Minyas. It may have been identical to or even surpassed the treasury of Atreus at Mycenae, but today it's not nearly in as good condition. The Greek traveler Pausanias, who visited the site in the 2nd century AD, had this to say about it. The treasure house of Minyas is one of the greatest wonders of the world, and of Greece. It is built in stone, circular in shape. They say the topmost stone is a keystone holding the entire building in place. Greeks are terribly prone to be wonderstruck by the exotic at the expense of home products. Distinguished historians have explained the pyramids in the greatest detail and not made the slightest mention of the treasure house of Minyas or the walls of Tiryns, which are by no means less marvelous. While such a description would normally suggest that Orchomenos must have been at the heart of a very important Mycenaean center, it lacks a large, monumental palace similar to sites such as Mycenae, Tiryns, or Pylos. There have also not been any Linear B tablets discovered there, 
implying that there was no sizable economic activity to be accounted for. These two absences have led a few scholars to come to the conclusion that Orcomenos may not have been a political and administrative center at all, but a ceremonial one that also served as an ancestral burial ground, perhaps for the rulers of nearby Gla. First excavated in 1893, with work still continuing to this day, the citadel at the site of Gla in Viotia was built around 1300 BC. Close to its cyclopean walls, the remains of several buildings were uncovered that contained storage rooms, what seems to have been a tiled administrative center, and a cistern. Gla was eventually destroyed around 1200 BC, after which it was never reoccupied. Just to the southeast of Gla is Thebes, a city that has featured prominently in the history of ancient Greece, especially during the Archaic and Classical periods. Most of ancient Thebes lies beneath the modern city of the same name, which has made excavating its Bronze Age remains extremely difficult. What has been dug up, though, shows that its residents during the Mycenaean period were quite wealthy. Archaeologists have uncovered shaft graves with swords and luxury grave goods belonging to Thebes' elites, along with the remains of workshops that specialized in creating objects out of gold, ivory, and stone. A large, pear-shaped palace known as the Cadmeion, or House of Cadmos, was discovered along with several Linear B tablets, proving that Mycenaean Thebes was once a very productive place. Though the capital of modern Greece and made famous during the country's archaic and classical periods, few today know of Athens' Mycenaean past. This is partially because most of the Bronze Age layers of the city and its acropolis have been covered over by three millennia of occupation since then. Archaeologists have determined, though, that Bronze Age Athens contained a citadel that was built around 1270 BC. In 1937, a staircase leading down to a hidden well was discovered within the North Circuit Wall. Scholars estimate that it dates to the 1220s BC. While the ruins of Mycenaean sites in Thessaly, Viotia, and Attica are impressive, the greatest palatial centers, in both size and splendor, are in the Peloponnese. With its imposing ruins nestled amidst the rugged hills of the northern Peloponnese, Mycenae stands as an awe-inspiring testament to the grandeur of prehistoric Greek civilization. Crowned by the iconic Lion Gate, its massive stone walls constructed with colossal Cyclopean stones evoke a sense of both strength and architectural sophistication. The archaeological remains of the citadel and the objects uncovered within it reveal that once upon a time, a very cultured and complex society thrived here. The Acropolis of Mycenae once contained a palace complex with the Megaron, courtyards, living quarters, and storage rooms. Mycenae's citadel played a central role in the military, administrative, and cultural life of this most powerful of all Mycenaean kingdoms. Along with grave circles A and B mentioned earlier, Mycenae has yielded several other burial sites, big ones in fact, such as the treasury of Atreus and the tomb of Clytemnestra. About nine miles south of Mycenae are the ruins of ancient Tyrans. The site spans different periods of Mycenaean civilization, with evidence of occupation during the early, middle, and late Hellenic periods, though it reached its zenith during the latter between 1400 to 1200 BC. Tiryns is most famous for its massive cyclopean walls and fortifications. Constructed out of large, irregularly shaped stones, Tiryns' walls still encircled the Acropolis and once featured several bastions and towers. Given its importance and fame as the home of the legendary King Nestor, it's almost unbelievable that the ruins of Pylos were only excavated in 1939 by archaeologist Carl Bledgen. 
although there are the remains of a great palace on its main hill, appropriately called the Palace of Nestor, there haven't been any traces of large citadel walls discovered there so far. However, the palace is the best preserved of any Mycenaean site, and consists of a megaron along with several surrounding rooms. At the center of the megaron are the remains of a large circular hearth and a place to the east side of the room where a wooden throne once stood. Perhaps just as spectacular are the archive rooms, where over 1,000 Linear B tablets were uncovered. Archaeologists also found bright frescoes on the remains of what were once the palace's walls. These are just some of the major Mycenaean sites for which there are substantial archaeological remains. There are numerous other areas of central and southern Greece that shared the same Mycenaean culture, religion, and language, but they were generally devoid of large citadels and palaces. In such areas, life probably continued much as it did during early Helladic times, with people living in villages and farming without much outside interference. It can be difficult to know much about the daily life of the common people of an ancient civilization because they're generally omitted from royal records and the proclamations of kings. However, archaeologists and anthropologists over the last few decades have been able to use the remains of various settlements, art and images created by the Mycenaeans themselves on pottery, metalwork, and frescoes, objects uncovered at grave sites, Linear B tablets, and DNA analysis to give us a better understanding of how the Greeks of the Late Bronze Age lived and worked. Most Mycenaean settlements, whether small hamlets or massive palatial centers, were generally adjacent to at least one fertile plain and a fresh water source. The reason for this was simple. Agriculture. Though their artwork and lofty citadels have given the impression that theirs was a total warrior society, the truth is that most people in Mycenaean Greece were farmers and lived in villages and small towns in the countryside, often within just a day or two's journey from a major citadel or palatial center. Luckily for us today, many of these settlements had their own administrators who recorded aspects of life in the countryside. Cereals were the staple crops that were grown and harvested on every Mycenaean farm. The most important of these were wheat and barley. Records uncovered at some sites indicate that daily wheat rations were about 1.5 cups, while those for barley were about 3 cups. Growing wheat and barley involved long hours in the field. Farmers would plant in fall from October to December and then harvest and thresh the grain between May and July. Linear B tablets also recorded extensive olive production, which after cereals were the most important and versatile crop. Not only could olives be eaten as soon as they were ripe, but they were also easy to store in jars so that they could be used for another day. From olives came olive oil, which was used in cooking, as a dressing, for lighting lamps, making soap, and in the creation of ointments. Like olives, olive oil was easy to store and could be exported without much difficulty. Depending on the location, many Mycenaeans also ate figs, almonds, walnuts, pistachios, and fruits such as cherries, strawberries, plums, and grapes, the latter which was used to make wine both for domestic and foreign consumption. To add a little bit of flavor, many foods were infused with spices such as coriander, basil, cumin, fennel, oregano, rosemary, and others. Flax was also cultivated to make both oil and linens. At Pylos, at least 200 women are recorded to have been working in the textile industry as flax spinners, linen weavers, and seamstresses. What's also interesting is that much of the flax was allocated to soldiers and sailors, who it's believed may have used it as the primary material for making clothing and sails for ships. Cattle was a source of food and leather, 
with the latter used in producing sandals, shoes, straps, and bridles. At least one tablet indicates that 234 ox hides were prepared annually for the palace at Pylos. Cattle was also offered regularly in religious sacrifices, so it must have been considered a valuable commodity in Mycenaean society. Goats were also raised for their meat, milk, and their hair, which could be used in weaving textiles. Sheep were bred for the same reasons and valued especially for their wool. Not everyone in towns and villages farmed or raised livestock. There were several people who would have been considered specialists in certain trades, such as carpenters, stonecutters, craftsmen, and metal workers. The larger the town, the more specialists it had. One Linear B tablet gives us a list of ingredients allocated to one such specialist, a perfume maker, for one of his special concoctions. It reads, Axotas gave to Thyestes, the perfume maker, the following ingredients to make perfume. 6 coriander seeds, 16 cypress seeds, wine, 576 liters, honey, 58 liters. Perfume makers created luxury goods that most in Mycenaean society probably could have done without. The same though can't be said of metal workers, who were arguably the most important specialists in Mycenaean Greece. By 1500 BC, the main metal in use throughout the mainland and the Aegean was bronze, which was needed for making swords, daggers, spear points, suits of armor, parts for chariots, farming tools, chisels, cooking pots, storage containers, cauldrons, and many of the important items that Mycenaean society needed in order to function. Tablets indicate that Pylos may have had as many as 400 bronze workers at any given time. Copper, the main component for making bronze, was scarce in Greece, and tin, the other vital element, non-existent. Both had to be imported. Of the two, copper was much easier to obtain. While nearby Crete did have some deposits of copper that could be shipped for export, it was likely Cyprus, with its enormous reserves, that supplied Mycenaean workshops with the metal. The source of tin used in Bronze Age Greece is harder to determine. While it is possible that some of it came from as far away as Iran and Afghanistan, there were much closer deposits in Central Europe. Many of the earlier swords found in shaft graves, such as those at Mycenae, seem to have been knockoffs of Minoan models. Several of them are beautifully decorated and were probably used more for ceremonial purposes than actual combat. However, the Mycenaeans did develop a short sword with a broader, stronger blade that was likely their preferred choice in battle. Most soldiers also carried long spears. Some warriors, especially those from the ranks of the aristocracy, wore suits made of bronze. Many also covered their heads with a boar's tusk helmet, which was a distinctly Mycenaean invention. As a typical boar's tusk helmet could consist of anywhere from 30 to 75 tusks, the more tusks that one collected, the greater status and prestige the warrior was perceived to have possessed. Such items were also very expensive and may have been passed down from father to son, much like a family heirloom. Based on the types of weapons discovered, as well as depictions of soldiers and artwork, military historians of ancient warfare have theorized that early Mycenaean armies from the late 16th to the 14th centuries BC generally consisted of heavy spearmen who were supported by swordsmen, light infantry, skirmishers, and often chariots. This was the preferred mode of fighting against rival palatial centers and citadels. For battling against less structured units, for example, stateless mountain tribes, mobile, light infantry seems to have been the best choice. There's a good deal of evidence to indicate that this mode of warfare increased in the 13th century BC 
which was around the same time that many of the larger Mycenaean sites were increasing their fortifications and constructing large stone ramparts. Some experts believe that this may not have been to protect against other Mycenaean states, but to ward off seaborne raiders who preferred more hit-and-run tactics. While scenes of brave men slaying wild animals and attacking lions are depicted in nearly every type of Mycenaean art, it's believed that mostly the aristocracy partook in such activities. Hunting was possibly their favorite pastime. The most popular game animal was wild boar, desired not just for its meat, but also for its tusks. Another animal that could bring hunters greater stature were lions. Until recently, it was thought that scenes of warriors hunting lions were simply displays of fantasy art. But recent archaeological findings have proved that mountain lions were still roaming throughout the Peloponnese during the Late Bronze Age. Mycenaeans also hunted less dangerous animals such as deer, hares, ducks, geese, and various birds. But these were mostly for food and not sport. Of all the animals that a man in Mycenaean society could possess, horses were the most prestigious. They're also an import, as horses are not known to have been in southern Greece until shortly before Mycenaean civilization began. The more horses one possessed, the greater wealth and status they were perceived to have had. To help horses, chariots, carts, and people in general travel more efficiently throughout the rough land that was Greece, the Mycenaeans developed a wide web of roads and bridges that connected many of the palace centers with each other, especially in the Peloponnese. This is rather fascinating, because it shows that there must have been a great deal of cooperation between the various Mycenaean kingdoms to have built such an extensive network. It also has led some scholars to make the case that the Mycenaeans were more politically unified than had previously been believed. One aspect of daily life that has been difficult for scholars to unravel is that of Mycenaean religion. What exactly did they believe? Which deities did they worship? And how did they worship them? The problem in knowing precise answers to these questions is that we have a good deal of material evidence, such as the remains of shrines, figurines, devotional images, and frescoes, but not a lot of descriptive, written material. There is some information that can be gleaned from Linear B tablets, but these don't tell us much about any specific doctrines or cosmology. If one were to simply go by the Iliad, it would seem then that there was little difference between Mycenaean religious beliefs and the popular Greek religion and pantheon that many of us are familiar with today. While some of the religious vocabulary and even the deities mentioned resemble those from the archaic and classical periods that would follow, we can't automatically assume that they're identical and would have had the same attributes or meaning. So far, there is no definitive consensus as to what the Mycenaeans believed. We do, though, have the names of several deities that are listed on various Linear B tablets dating to close to the fall of Mycenaean civilization in the late 13th century BC. Tablets from Pylos dating to around this time mention several gods and goddesses whose names are either variations of, or in some cases, nearly identical to those found in the classical Greek pantheon namely Zeus, Hera, Athena, Poseidon, Artemis, and Apollo. Their relationship to each other, though, cannot be determined. For example, there's no indication that Zeus held the role of the greatest or king of the gods, as he was known to be in later Greek religion. In fact, the god who appears to have been the most important and venerated, at least in tablets from Pylos, was Poseidon, because he consistently got the most offerings of any deity. Other Mycenaean deities mentioned in Linear B tablets are not present in later Greek religion, such as Marineus, Dewia, and Komoentea. They may have been minor gods that were eventually forgotten. 
Linear B tablets also reveal that priests and priestesses had a large role in Mycenaean religion. Their job was to determine the will of the gods and to conduct rituals and sacrifices in their honor. Offerings usually included useful animals such as bulls and goats, but as we'll see later on, humans as well. From around 1800 to 1450 BC, the Minoans dominated the waters of the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean through their fast ships and mastery of the maritime trade networks that connected their home island of Crete with mainland Greece, the Cycladic Islands, southwestern Anatolia, Cyprus, the Levant, and Egypt. Based on their colorful frescoes, most people have the impression that the Minoans were a rather peaceful people. This may have been the case, or they simply didn't depict warfare in their artwork. From what we know though, the Minoans did not establish a formal empire in the political sense, but due to their extensive maritime commercial activities, their influence in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean was substantial. There's little doubt that the Minoans and their culture inspired and influenced the people living on the Greek mainland. As we've seen, Mycenaean elites were already fond of the goods that Minoan traders brought to their shores from all over the Aegean and Mediterranean world, and it's only natural that they would have imitated and adopted many Minoan cultural and religious practices as their own. But trade and influence between the two wasn't just a one-way street. For their part, the Mycenaeans supplied their Minoan partners with raw materials such as wool and timber, as well as agricultural products such as wheat, olives, and wine. Many Mycenaeans may have also provided security or military services to groups of Minoans, especially on the nearby islands. At the site of Akrotiri, on the island of Thera, also known as Santorini, there's a house containing a number of miniature frescoes, including one that depicts several warriors, who many scholars believe are depictions of Mycenaean soldiers, for they march in formation and carry swords, long spears or lances, broad shields, and helmets that appear to be similar to the boar tusk ones that have been uncovered at several Mycenaean burial sites. As the rest of the scene in the fresco is rather tranquil, and the soldiers are not engaged in battle, it's thought that if these were indeed Mycenaean soldiers, then perhaps they were employed as mercenaries by the locals on Thera to keep the peace, and or protect the town from pirates and other dangers. Around 1600 BC, one of the most powerful volcanic eruptions of the past several thousand years occurred on the island of Thera. It threw immense and unmeasurable amounts of ash and pumice into the atmosphere. Though most of it fell into the sea, the fierce winds of the Aegean dumped large quantities of it on eastern Crete, where it may have reached a height of up to 10 centimeters in some areas. According to scientists, this would have rendered the local farmland in such areas useless for at least the next year or so and led to starvation for many of the communities that relied on agriculture for their livelihood. The eruption would have also triggered earthquakes and waves of massive tsunamis that would have destroyed coastal towns and harbors, as well as any ships in their path. Such a cataclysmic event and its after effects would have without a doubt disrupted communication with clients and trading outposts within the vast Minoan maritime empire. But that's not all. The volcano's impact may have been a catalyst for the rapid decline and downfall of Minoan civilization. The history of Crete in the 15th and 14th centuries BC is both extremely interesting and very mysterious. The island went through profound change, with all things Minoan on Crete going into decline and gradually being replaced with elements of Mycenaean culture. How this happened has puzzled scholars for well over a century, but they have a few explanations. One is that the eruption of the volcano on Thera 
had less of an impact on the Greek mainland and few long-term shocks to the major Mycenaean settlements and citadels. Over the next century or so, as the Minoans lost their supremacy on the high seas, Mycenaean Greeks from the mainland were more than happy to step into any economic and political vacuums that had been created, both in the Aegean as well as on the Minoans' own home island of Crete. Around 1450 BC, the major palace centers of Malia, Phaistos, and Zakros all show evidence of destruction by fire. Only the palatial center of Canossus seems to have survived. The exact cause of these fires is unknown, but interestingly, Linear B tablets start showing up in the archaeological record on Crete not too long afterward, especially at the palace of Canossus which seems to have continued its function as an administrative center under a new Mycenaean regime. The great destruction at the main Minoan palace centers around 1450 BC had previously led many to believe that it had been caused by a foreign invasion from the Greek mainland, specifically by Mycenaeans. But today, many scholars are of the opinion that this was unlikely, since in their view, the destruction throughout the island would have been much greater had there been a violent conquest. They argue that it's more likely that a civil war, an insurrection against their local rulers, an earthquake, or some other unforeseen calamity was to blame, and in the aftermath of this, Mycenaean Greeks from the mainland came to colonize Crete and take over whatever aspects of Minoan society still remained including the palace center at Canossus. The Mycenaeans weren't at Canossus for very long, as by 1350 BC, it too had been destroyed, perhaps by an earthquake, but scholars also have not ruled out that the destruction may have been intentional. Following the destruction of the palace at Canossus, Mycenaean culture spread rapidly throughout the Aegean and within a century became the dominant one in the region. Most scholars are of the opinion that there's little archaeological evidence to indicate that the majority of Mycenaean palace centers were ever politically unified under one ruler. They may have had a similar culture, religion, language, and writing system, but few would go as far as to say that they were all part of a single state with one king at the helm. Instead, it's believed that the citadels and palace centers acted with one another much like the city-states of Archaic and Classical Greece, forming alliances whenever necessary to protect themselves against a common foe, but also fighting with each other to further their own specific interests. But. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, as the great astronomer Carl Sagan once said. Could there at one time have been a great or high king in the Mycenaean world akin to that of Agamemnon in the Iliad? For some scholars, the answer is an absolute yes. Those who held Mycenae, that well-wrought citadel, and wealthy Corinthos, and well-wrought Cleonae. Commander of their hundred vessels was Lord Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and with him came the most troops by far, and the best, and among them he himself stood, armed in his gleaming bronze, exalting, preeminent among all the heroes, since he was the greatest and brought by far the largest force. This is just one brief description of Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, and the power that he held within the Greek world, at least according to the Iliad. But did a ruler like him actually exist in Mycenaean Greece during the Late Bronze Age? There are a few historical textual sources suggesting that a ruler of at least one Mycenaean state during that period was recognized as a great king and feared abroad. These texts, though, do not come from Greece or even the Aegean, but from the ruins of Hattusha, the once great capital city of the mighty Hittite Empire. 
There, at the beginning of the 20th century, nearly 10,000 mostly cuneiform tablets were discovered. Several of the tablets ended up being diplomatic correspondence between various Hittite kings and their counterparts in Egypt, Babylonia, and Assyria, while others were addressed to their numerous vassals throughout Anatolia and the Levant. One text discovered at Hattusha is addressed to a certain Maduwata, a vassal of the Hittite king Arnuwanda who ruled around 1400 BC. At the beginning of the letter, Arnuwanda recounts events dating to the reign of his father, Turhalia II, and a king named Atarisiya of Ahia. Atarisiya, the ruler of Ahia, chased you, Maduwata, out of your land. Then he harassed you and kept chasing you, and he continued to seek an evil death for you, Maduwata. He would have killed you, but you fled and the father of my majesty saved you from death. He got rid of Atarasiya for you. Otherwise, Atarasiya would not have left you alone, but would have killed you. The text is over 90 lines, and mostly consists of reminders to Maduwata of how Arnuwanda's father and predecessor, Tudhalia II, aided him during his time of need, and how grateful he should have been, since, later on in the letter, we learn that Maduwata betrayed the Hittite king by allying himself with the Tarasiya of Ahia to attack Alashia, or Cyprus, which was a Hittite imperial possession at the time. It's definitely a very interesting story, but what really excited archaeologists and historians alike when they first read this letter are the two mentions of a place called Ahia, the short form of Ahiyawa. Many scholars believe that Ahiyawa is the Hittite name for Achaeans, one of the terms that Homer uses in the Iliad to refer to the Greeks. Atarasia was a very powerful opponent, for according to the letter, he was able to call up 100 chariots and an unspecified number of infantry for battle against one of the Hittite king's generals. The letter goes on. And you, Maduwata, once more did not resist Atarasiya, but broke ranks before him. Then Kisnapili came and took charge of you from Hati. Kisnapili went in battle against Atarasiya. One hundred chariots and infantry of Atarasiya drew up, and they fought. There are other texts from around the same time period that may also allude to both contacts and conflicts between Hittites and Mycenaean Greeks in western Anatolia. One describes a rebellion by a confederation of at least 22 cities and little states known in Hittite texts as the Asuan Confederacy. In the battle that followed, the Hittite king, either Tudhalia I or the second, but most likely the second, was victorious and captured at least 10,000 soldiers of the Asuan Confederacy, along with 600 teams of horses, the king of Asua, and his son, Kukuli. Tudhalia eventually let Kukuli go, and later even appointed him as the new king of Asua, but the latter rebelled, and he was eventually put to death. There is reference to this conflict in a badly damaged tablet discovered in the Hittite archives of Atusha that appears to be a copy of a letter from the king of Ahiyawa to his Hittite counterpart. The names of both kings are lost to us, but most authorities on the matter believe that the Hittite ruler being addressed in the letter is Muwatali II, who ruled between 1295 to 1272 BC. What remains of the letter primarily describes a dispute over the ownership of a group of islands in the eastern Aegean. The Hittite claim is that the islands were just one of the spoils of war after they defeated the king of the Asuan confederacy, but the unnamed current king of Ahiyawa states that the islands had been given to his ancestor as a gift from Asua's then ruler before he was defeated and overthrown by the Hittites. 
From this, it's clear that the king of Ahiyawa had at least some relation to Asua, and may have even lent its ruler military support. If Ahiyawa and Mycenaean Greece are indeed one and the same, then this might be more proof that contacts between them and the Hittites go back several generations. Additional proof of this is the discovery of a Mycenaean-style sword within the premises of the ruins of the Hittite capital of Hattusha. On the blade is inscribed the following text in Akkadian. As Tudhalia, the great king, shattered the Ashua country, he dedicated these swords to the storm god, his lord. The discovery of a Mycenaean-style sword, presumably one of many, taken from some hapless enemy soldier doesn't prove who the wielder was. While it could have been a Mycenaean soldier in the service of the king of Ahiyawa, the sword could also have belonged to a Mycenaean mercenary fighting for Asua, or someone else entirely. If the Trojan War is indeed based on historical events, then most scholars believe it would have taken place sometime around 1250 BC. Given this, it's useful to examine letters between Hittite rulers and their Ahiyawan counterparts dating to around that time. The Hittite king whose reign coincides with this date is Hattushili III, who ruled from 1267 to 1237 BC. One of the most intriguing documents from his reign is what's known as the Tawagalawa Letter. Though the author isn't named, it's believed that the letter was sent on behalf of Hattusili III to the unnamed king of Ahiyawa. It's been determined that the original letter consisted of three tablets, but unfortunately, the first two are lost to us. But we can deduce from the third tablet that the main issue at hand seems to be the extradition of a renegade named Pia Maradu, whose crimes in the westernmost parts of the Hittite Empire were many. One of these was recruiting, or more likely forcing, thousands of Hittite subjects to move across the Aegean Sea to some destination further to the west. The reason for rounding them up isn't stated but a few scholars believe that they may have been needed as labor to work on the construction of Mycenaean citadels and palatial centers on the Greek mainland. This makes sense when you consider that the great expansions to the citadels of Mycenae, Tiryns, and Thebes tend to date to around this time. Hattushili personally led a force to apprehend Pia Maradu, but to no avail. The criminal is reported to have ultimately escaped by ship to Ahiyawa, whose king was giving him shelter. Like other correspondence between the great rulers of the ancient Near East, the Tawagalawa letter also has a fascinating backstory, which I'll cover in another program. What makes it extremely interesting for scholars of Mycenaean Greece is how the Hittite king, in this case Hattusili III, addresses and shows a great deal of respect to the ruler of Ahiyawa. When Hattushili writes to his counterpart, he addresses him as my brother, which meant that at least diplomatically, the Hittite king considered the ruler of Ahiyawa to have been his equal. Not only this, but Hattushili also makes reference to a past conflict over the city or state of Wilusa. Wilusa is the Hittite name for Troy. In the Tawagalawa letter, Hattushili requests the king of Ahiyawa to do the following with regard to the renegade Piramaradu. O my brother, write to him this one thing, if nothing else. Get up and go off to Hatti. Your lord has reconciled with you. If not, then come over to Ahiyawa, and in whatever location I settle you, get up and resettle in another location. So long as you are hostile to the king of Hatti, be hostile from another land. Do not be hostile from my land. If you would rather be in Karkia or Masa, go there. 
the king of Hatti has persuaded me about the matter of the land of Wilusa concerning which he and I were hostile to one another, and we have made peace. Now, hostility is not appropriate between us. The mention of some sort of conflict between the king of Ahiyawa and the Hittites at Wilusa, aka Troy, strengthens the case for those who believe that the Trojan War was indeed based upon a historical conflict. Yet another interesting fact is that Hattusili's brother and predecessor, Muwatali II, made a treaty with a certain Alexandu of Wilusa. The name Alexandu sounds awfully similar to the Greek Alexandros, and many believe that it's just the Hittite pronunciation of the same name. In Homer's Iliad, Alexandros, also known as Paris, is the prince of Troy who abducted Helen, the wife of King Menelaus of Sparta. Menelaus was the brother of Agamemnon, the king of Mycenae. In the treaty with Alexandu, Muwatali II states, And as I protected you, Alexandu, in good will because of the word of your father, and came to your aid, and killed your enemy for you, later in the future my sons and my grandsons will certainly protect your descendant for you, to the first and second generation. If some enemy arises for you, I will not abandon you, just as I have not now abandoned you. I will kill your enemy for you. But if your brother or someone of your family revolts, or later someone revolts against your son or your grandsons, and they seek the kingship of the land of Wilusa, I will absolutely not depose you, Alexandu. I will not take that one into my service. As he is your enemy, in exactly the same way, he is my enemy. I will destroy his land. That's a pretty strong endorsement of Alexandu, who would have been an important ally given Wilusa's, or Troy's, strategic position on the Aegean at the western edge of the Hittite Empire. Suppose, hypothetically, that Alexandu of Wilusa is the same as Alexandros or Paris of Troy. If that is indeed the case, then the king of Ahiyawa, with whom Hattusili states there was a past conflict with over Wilusa, could be the same person as Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek coalition against Troy. Alexandu may not have actually snuck off with the Spartan king's wife. That detail could have simply been added to the story many years later to make it more entertaining for future audiences. But he might have committed some grave offense against a Mycenaean king that may have demanded nothing less than a military response against him and Wilusa, which would have by treaty obliged the Hittite king to come to his aid. There's no way to currently prove this, but such an entanglement between Mycenaean Greeks and the Hittites, or their allies, may be the historical basis for the epic poem that became the Iliad, the story of the Trojan War. Text dating to the reign of Hattusili's successor, Tudhalia IV, between the years 1237 to 1209 BC, also make references to Ahiyawa. One is a treaty with Shaushkamua, the ruler of the coastal Levantine state of Amuru. Shaushkamua was Tudhalia's nephew. He was also married to Tudhalia's sister, which made him the king's brother-in-law as well. It may seem a bit strange that a Hittite king would make a treaty with another Hittite, let alone one so closely related to him but the reason may have been to assure that Shaushkamua would remain loyal to Tuthalia and his progeny. Hittite history is full of discontented sons, brothers, and other relatives scheming against their king. In fact, several Hittite rulers had been deposed or assassinated by family members. After all, Tuthalia's father, Hattusili III, was himself a usurper who forcibly took the throne from his own nephew, Murshili III. 
the treaty with Shaoshikamua makes the following demands. If the king of Egypt is my majesty's friend, he shall be your friend. But if he is my majesty's enemy, he shall be your enemy. And the kings who are my equals in rank are the king of Egypt, the king of Babylonia, the king of Assyria, and the king of Ahiyawa. Because I, my majesty, have begun war with the king of Assyria, no ship of Ahiyawa may go to him. Tudhalia IV was trying to impose an economic blockade of Assyria, whose king, Tukulti Ninurta I, had become his great nemesis. Eventually, relations must have soured between Tudhalia and the king of Ahiyawa, because a second document mentions how the latter, allegedly, aided a rebellion against the Hittite throne. Thus speaks Tudhalia, the great king. The land of the Seha River transgressed again for a second time. Thereafter, Tarhunaradu, king of the land of the Seha River, waged war and relied on the king of Ahiyawa. Relied on the king of Ahiyawa implies that Tarhunaradu received military aid from him. Seha was an area just southeast of Wilusa, aka Troy. Despite such textual evidence, not every scholar of Mycenaean studies is of the opinion that Ahiyawa was a state or even a confederation based within Mycenaean Greece. Several, including the famed scholar Ferdinand Sommer, made the case almost a century ago that Ahiyawa is not the same as Achaioia, the latter being the word from which Achaeans is derived. For him, it's just a coincidence that the two sound the same. Most of those who subscribe to this argument also believe that Ahiyawa was a kingdom somewhere in western Anatolia. However, in light of recent documents, those who believe that Ahiyawa was indeed a Mycenaean kingdom make the case that given the stretch of the Hittite Empire far into western Anatolia to the shores of the Aegean, it would have been nearly impossible for another state to have also existed there. Colonies and settlements such as Milawanda, yes, that's basically been proven. But a full, regional superpower based there seems highly unlikely. Other texts also mention that Ahiyawa was across the sea from Hittite territory. The only places that really meet this criteria are Cyprus, Egypt, and whatever peoples at the time lived on the northern coasts of the Black Sea, all of whom can easily be ruled out. The only other options remaining is someplace on the Greek mainland or a large island such as Crete. The majority of Mycenaean trade was with the civilizations of the Eastern Mediterranean. By the end of the 14th century BC, commercial links with parts of western and southern Anatolia, the Levant, and Egypt had been established. A typical journey for a Mycenaean ship would have likely started at one of the ports on the mainland, such as Nafplio or Pylos, and then sailed to Crete. From there, the ship would take advantage of the Mediterranean's winds and travel southeast to Egypt. After dropping off or picking up new cargo, the ship would then ride the sea currents that would help to propel it to the northeast and the coasts of Canaan and the Levant, where they would most likely end up at the commercial emporium of Ugarit. The return journey home would leave from Ugarit, stop in Cyprus, and then catch the east-west current that would take them along the coasts of Tarhuntasa and Luka in southern Anatolia to what's today Rhodes before island hopping around the southern Aegean on their way back home. According to those specializing in nautical archaeology, Late Bronze Age Mycenaean ships were quite like the Minoan ones that preceded them, though a bit smaller. Unfortunately, we don't have a complete model of such a ship, but based on the rather limited evidence gathered so far, mostly images from pottery shards and a few seals, 
They appear to have been galleys, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 meters long with a square sail that was mounted on a central mast. A typical galley could accompany at least 40 oarsmen, along with the captain and some soldiers, and were light enough to be easily beached on land. Below the deck, there was space for sizable quantities of raw materials and finished goods. Examples of the cargo such galleys may have once carried come from a few shipwrecks that have been discovered off the southern coast of Turkey and in the Argolic Gulf. Of these, the most famous is the Ulubarun shipwreck discovered in 1982 near the coastal town of Kas, Turkey. Dating to approximately 1300 BC, the objects uncovered from the floor of the sea indicate that the Ulubarun wreck contained over 350 copper ingots weighing around 10 tons, along with another ton of tin, which combined is enough to make about 11 tons of bronze. Lead isotope analysis indicates that the copper came from Cyprus, while a 2022 study suggests that the tin came from multiple sources, with about a third coming from as far away as modern Uzbekistan, while the rest were likely to have been mined in the Taurus Mountains of Turkey. In addition to these raw materials, nearly a ton of terebinth resin was discovered in jars of Canaanite origin. Terebinth resin was used in making perfume as well as incense. There were also large quantities of colored glass, copper and bronze vessels, gold and silver jewelry, blackwood and cedar logs, elephant and hippopotamus tusks, tortoise shells, ostrich eggs, a trumpet made of ivory, weapons, tools, stone weights, and the remains of olives and pits from some fruits. It's difficult to determine if the ship was a Mycenaean galley or one whose home base was Cyprus or some Near Eastern port such as Ugarit. The cargo and the route, though, all but confirm that the ship was traveling from east to west and likely headed to some destination within the Mycenaean world. But what did the Mycenaeans exchange in return? The Greek mainland is poor in deposits of raw materials that were desired both at home and abroad. Instead, Mycenaean palatial complexes likely exported a wide array of finished goods to markets in Egypt, Anatolia, Cyprus, Canaan and the Levant, and also parts of southeastern and central Europe. Products such as wine, olives, olive oil, and perfumes manufactured at palatial centers in Greece found their way to destinations overseas, as there have been numerous remains of standard, Mycenaean-style jars and pottery discovered throughout the Near East, especially at sites of what were once ancient port cities. It was not the containers that were the prize so much as the contents within. In the 13th century BC, something strange was happening in Greece and the islands of the Aegean. No one today knows exactly what was going on, but around 1250 BC, many Mycenaean palatial centers began to divert more of their resources into strengthening their fortification systems. The walls of Mycenae were greatly expanded, and there were efforts to secure the citadel's water supply by carving out a passageway leading to an underground reservoir. Parts of Mycenae's defensive walls were specifically expanded in order to better protect it. At nearby Tiryns, improvements to the fortifications of the upper citadel were carried out, while the lower citadel was enclosed behind a large Cyclopean wall. Other Mycenaean sites in the north, such as Gla and Thebes, made similar adjustments. The Acropolis of Athens was also further fortified, and access to its water source made possible only by a secret, diagonal stairway descending down to it. Pylos didn't build any fortification walls, but its leaders did take some precautions by integrating its workshops and storerooms with the main buildings of the palace, where they'd presumably be safer. Several tablets from the archives also record the organization of a sort of coast guard to defend the shores around Pylos and Messenia. 
Such actions by several palatial centers and citadels indicate that there was the general fear not only of an attack, but also the possibility of a prolonged siege, either from the forces of other Mycenaean states or some foreign group. If there were attacks by hostile foreigners, then the Greek mainland wasn't alone. In 1209 BC, the Egyptian pharaoh Merenta recorded an attack from the west led by hostile Libyans and their allies, who he mentioned specifically by name as the Ekwesh, Teresh, Luka, Sherdin, Shekelesh, northerners coming from all lands. With the exception of the Luka, who were from the coastal regions of southwestern Anatolia, the homeland of the other allies in the Libyan coalition is still hotly debated, but most scholars suspect that they came from various parts of the Mediterranean, including as far away as Sicily and Sardinia. While Marenta claimed victory, many of the group's members would come back to attack Egypt and much of Anatolia and the Levant in the decades that followed. Around 1200 BC, just over two generations after palatial centers such as Mycenae and Tiryns had erected their massive Cyclopean walls, Mycenaean civilization itself collapsed. Over 3200 years later, how this occurred is still debated by archaeologists and scholars of Hellenic studies. Everything from a severe earthquake to civil unrest, economic decline, revolution, and invasion by foreigners has been suggested. Perhaps it was a combination of several of these. Perhaps none of them. What archaeologists have determined is that by the early 12th century BC, the sites of Mycenae, Tiryns, Medea, Pylos, Gla, Thebes, and other Mycenaean sites were destroyed, most of them by fire. While parts of Mycenae and Tiryns were somewhat rebuilt and reoccupied for short periods in the centuries that followed, other sites such as Pylos and Gla were abandoned and forever left to ruin. Athens, though, seems to have suffered the least damage, and from what we can tell, continued to function. The popular hypothesis is that the Mycenaean palatial centers suffered lethal attacks from hordes of stateless outsiders who we commonly refer to as barbarians today. While the attackers may have left behind a trail of death and destruction, they themselves have mostly disappeared from the archaeological record. There is a good deal of evidence indicating that throughout the 13th century BC, the outlying villages around Mycenae were often attacked and set to the torch. It may have been such constant attacks that prompted the rulers of the various Mycenaean kingdoms around 1250 BC to build their massive walls and take measures to protect their water supplies. Evidence of a sudden, almost simultaneous collapse comes from both the archaeological record as well as a number of Linear B tablets uncovered at various Mycenaean sites. The tablet labeled PYJN829 from Pylos tells of how bronze from various temples had to be distributed to the community's leaders for making spear points, meaning that there must have been some sort of military emergency on the horizon. Part of the tablet reads something like this. Thus will give the officials and masters and deputy officials and key bearers and fig supervisors and digging supervisors, temple bronze as points for light javelins and spears. The text goes on to allocate the bronze into units equivalent to about 2 kilograms for each official and 0.75 kilograms for each deputy. And then there's tablet PYTN316 that mentions sacrificial victims being offered to the gods presumably to gain victory over whoever was threatening Pylos. It's dated to around the same time as tablet PNJN829 and reads as follows. In the month of Ploistoios, at Pylos he consecrates at Sphagianus and he brings gifts and leads the sacrificial victims. 
to Potnia, one gold cup, one woman. To Manasa, one gold dish, one woman. To Posidea, one gold dish, one woman. To Thrice Hero, one gold cup. To Dupatis, one gold cup. At Pylos. At Pylos, he consecrates at the shrine of Poseidon, and the town takes part. And he brings gifts, and he leads sacrificial victims. One gold cup, two women, Duboya and Komoentea. The identity of the men and women offered as sacrifices isn't revealed. They could have been prisoners of war, slaves, or perhaps even volunteers who were willing to give up their lives for the greater good of their community. The tablets describing the sacrifice date to shortly before the fall of Pylos, around 1200 BC. So the event described was probably a last-ditch effort to secure some divine aid in order to ward off whatever, or whoever, was about to bring on the city's destruction. Apparently, desperate times called for desperate measures. As for the identity of the attackers, some scholars have proposed that they came from northern Greece or somewhere else in southeastern Europe while many others have argued that they might be one or several of the groups associated with the so-called Sea Peoples who are mentioned in texts and inscriptions from Egypt and Ugarit. An older but popular view is that the attackers were somehow related to the Dorians mentioned in later Greek literature and other sources, but this has now mostly been refuted due to lack of archaeological evidence. Others believe that internal social, economic, and political issues within the Mycenaean world may have been the cause for its ultimate collapse. They make the case that competition for scarce resources became exceedingly fierce, and this may have led to unrest and later rebellions by the common people, who overthrew their rulers and burned their palaces. Such unrest may have been exacerbated by a change in the climate, which would have affected crop yields and other aspects of the mostly agrarian Mycenaean economy. News of a successful revolt and destruction at one site may have prompted others to do the same, and soon, the whole palatial system was upended. The circumstances and ultimate cause of the collapse of the Mycenaean system around 1200 BC may never fully be understood, but it was definitely a fundamental turning point in the history of Greece and the wider Aegean world. The great palace structures and citadels were never rebuilt, and most of them completely abandoned. The next few decades afterward saw trade with many parts of the outside world, especially the eastern Mediterranean, evaporate, save for a few areas along the coast of Greece and some islands of the Aegean. Linear B and the art of writing, which had essentially been created to keep an account of the activities of the great palatial centers, was no longer needed, and ultimately forgotten. All this doesn't mean that Mycenaean culture, religion, and language completely died out, but it gradually evolved over the centuries into something closer to what we see in the archaic and classical periods of Greek history. In a sense, the Mycenaeans were never truly forgotten in Greece. Their descendants may not have known them by that name, but thanks to the works of Homer, the glory and splendor of their great civilization was remembered throughout the ages until today, when we have the knowledge and tools to really know much more about their world and who they really were. There's lots more with regard to Greek history coming up, so be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. Thanks for watching. I'd also really like to thank the channel's patrons for making videos like this possible. Seriously, I appreciate all you do. These include, but are certainly not limited to, Grandkek69, Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eck, Wanex TV, Robert Morgan, Strobex, Frank, Tim Lane, Sebastian Hurtado Correa, Michael Trudell, Leader Titan, Micah G, John Scarberry, Andrew Bomer, Connor Dolson, Krish, David R., Stephen Ball, 
Gabe, Monty Grimes, Franz Robbins, Cyrus Mir, Diane Astra, Nimrod Nir, Hypno San, Brendan Redman, Farai Dundada Chanji, Adil Minotra Homji, Jimmy Daruwala, Anahita Debu, Gulistan Debu, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Also, shout out to Arcus Travel for arranging visits to many of the sites seen in this program. Their team went above and beyond what was expected, and I couldn't have visited all of these places without their help. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and X, formerly known as Twitter, as well as continue to listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe.